nothing but refreshing my page. <laughs> Just sitting there continually showing the latest stuff. <laughs> cool. That's awesome. Cool stuff, Dave. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, let me bring us to order. Thanks, Dave. All right, so I, let me uh, let me do a little uh, shilling of our stuff first, and then I'll I'll put Dan on for his his talk of what's what, what's going on. So welcome everybody who's here. We got about fifteen or so people. Uh, so um, for those of you that just joined, we were talking a little. Dave, Dave uh, Bishop was showing us a little bit of, of his uh, supernova page, and if you're unfamiliar with it, just go to our website. It's uh, rochesterastronomy.org. And in one of the tabs is, is the, a link to Dave's supernova page is actually used very scientifically by a lot of organizations that you just may have just heard to uh, track supernova, report supernova. And uh, one of the things that uh, we want to try to do is to use the Mies telescope to image supernova. And we're going to be able to do that because of what Dan's going to talk about tonight is the transformation of the Mies telescope to a a remote platform that we've been able to been able to do over the last uh, it was over the last few years, but uh, pretty amazing thing we're able to do. Uh, so that's where we're at. So let me uh, let me do my little shill here of what uh, what's going on coming up, and then I'll turn this over to Dan to talk. So for those of you that uh, are interested, we have uh, upcoming events. We have a board meeting the first week in March. It's a busy week because we have a board meeting on Wednesday, Friday. We'll have a talk by Don Feiger of RIT on the infrared imaging instrument on the James Webb telescope. So that'll be an interesting talk about what, uh, what's, how that scope works and how the optics works. You really what Webb is all about because it really is an infrared uh, instrument. Uh, that's our next uh, February talk at RIT. Um, excuse me, that's March. It says, I said, I said February, it's March 4th. Um, and then the following day is New Moon Weekend. We'll do a Messier Marathon in Ionia. And I hope to do it virtually, if it's clear. I will be sit up in the uh, C14, the big dome, and I'll uh, try to stream a Messier Marathon. You can watch me struggle to go through place to place to place until it gets cloudy, whatever, to do a uh, Messier Marathon. And then uh, we have an open house the following day, which if uh, I have any success at the Messier Marathon, I probably will not be attending because I'll be trying to get some sleep at that point. But uh, feel free to come out, whether virtually, I will stream it and I'll send a link, link out when we get closer or come out and do try to do your own Messier Marathon. It's a fun thing to do. Even if you don't get far to observe some of the night, it's a fun thing to do. I think that's about it. Oh, one more thing is uh, we're going to have Rocha Star Fest in uh, July, July, I didn't put the dates in here, but I wanted to announce that we have a t-shirt contest. So if uh, you're interested, uh, we don't have a lot of astronomy section swag, and we thought that we would try to increase that by looking for a t-shirt design for the Rochester Star Fest for this year. And so if you can come up with a, we want a simple design, we don't want to have it too many colors and be too complicated, so it would make an easy shirt to make. Uh, so one or two color, kind of a line art maybe thing. Um, for Rochester Star Fest, send, send your design to me. I'll bring it up to the board. The board will vote on uh, what we want to do for a design. We'll order shirts for the Rochester Star Fest. And whoever shirt we choose, design we choose, gets free admission, dinner, and t-shirt to the event. So it's a free Rochester Star Fest if, you, if you're able to come up with a winning design for our t-shirt. All right, that's me. That's all of me. Now let me turn it over to uh, Dan Watson, uh, professor of physics and astronomy at the University of Rochester. And one of the minds behind making it happen over at Mies with the, the technical conversion of the U of R Mies Observatory to remote operation. And with that, I will turn this over to Dan. Oops. Uh, oh, never mind. I, I just got a note from Zoom saying that uh, I'm about to terminate your uh, uh, your own screen share. Oh. Anyway, thanks, Mark. Uh, uh, let's see. Glancing down the list, I see lots of people I know, so I probably don't need to uh, 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 make myself any more familiar than I already am. Uh, this is uh, uh, what I'm going to show you is a, a talk that 
uh, I gave at the request of Dave Cameron last fall when he had uh, a meeting of the uh, local MIT Alumni uh, Association. Uh, and uh, that drew a, uh, a bunch of people who were both uh, uh, MIT alumni and uh, you know, uh, Xerox, Kodak, uh, uh, BNL, ITT, Harris, uh, uh, engineer alumni, uh, and a great time was had by all. So Mark decided that it was a, a good thing to uh, offer uh, everybody else too, just in case uh, uh, things can be gleaned from it that uh, we learned at Mies that would be useful to do uh, uh, elsewhere. And the topic is what we need needed to do to make an observatory remotely accessible. And uh, I should mention right at the top that remotely accessible is the way uh, uh, everybody who uses uh, the big observatories on mountaintops in the West and Chile and, uh, and all that actually do their observations. It's been a, a fairly big culture change because uh, our current generation of graduate students is probably going to graduate without ever having physically been to a, a, a telescope on a tall mountain. Uh, hardly anybody goes observing at Mauna Kea anymore. Uh, and the reason is that our, our bandwidth is so large and our uh, you know, internal surveillance technology uh, good enough that uh, we can do almost everything from home. And uh, once one is no longer a student, uh, one looks for opportunities not to have to go to places like uh, Mauna Kea as, as uh, interesting as it is to uh, uh, travel to Hawaii, uh, it does turn out to, to uh, uh, be something you can get tired of. So uh, that's uh, remote observing is what uh, is what we usually do nowadays, not just on the uh, uh, space telescopes, but also on the uh, telescopes, the highly sought telescopes on uh, tall mountains in the, in the West and in the Pacific and in the South. So uh, uh, Mies now is no exception. Uh, we have uh, uh, made that uh, operable by remote control. I would be showing you uh, uh, actual live uh, remote control of Mies uh, right now, except that uh, uh, Kelly Douglas's class is on the telescope tonight because it turns out to be clear in a couple of hours. They're taking their flat field frames right now and they're gonna be working all night. So uh, uh, the telescope is actually in use by, uh, by students and we have really striven to uh, make it possible to use all the clear hours that we have. And that's been a, uh, uh, that's been a good thing for the, for the classes at the U of R because we have expanded the uh, number of classes that actually use uh, the telescope that do challenging uh, observing projects on the telescope. So that's what this is uh, uh, going to be about. I'm just going to uh, uh, show you you know, what we had to buy, what we had to get working in order to uh, uh, make it remotely accessible. I hope this won't take uh, uh, very long. Uh, if you would like to see uh, more in the way of what Mies is these days and, uh, you know, some sample images and things like that, I bet uh, lots of you uh, uh, know about the Mies uh, website, which I have uh, outlined here. Uh, if you don't know how to get to the Mies website, that's another thing that is linked off of the uh, ASRAS site. So what one needs to make an observatory remotely accessible? The first thing you need is something that you don't have any control over and uh, uh, for which uh, New York is astoundingly poorly provisioned. You need a good site. Uh, like any other observatory, it needs to be you know, one that is uh, uh, dark, uh, has as little water vapor as you can get, uh, has good weather, and uh, importantly is situated a lot higher than its surroundings. Uh, <clears throat> some of these things are satisfied by knees. We, we uh, as you know, uh, satisfy marginally the, the dark requirement. The uh, image here is the uh, uh, the sky brightness uh, that uh, you can look up on uh, clear dark sky. 
and you can read off the various municipalities by the peak and the brightness here and the uh, uh, other major geographical features like Lake Ontario and the Adirondacks by the fact that they're uh, dark and uh, West Central Pennsylvania also by the fact that it's dark. We're not nearly that dark at Mies. We're uh, just in the uh, in the darker green. And Ionia, I think, is over. Let's see. This this blot here is Canandaigua. So Ionia must be about. Uh, it's close to the top of the cross that I drew uh, through Mies. So Mies is darker than Ionia, but uh, not by you know a, a, a huge factor. Uh, like it is in the in the hills in uh, West Central Pennsylvania, and uh, as you know, in in Ionia, the southern boundary of the, of this uh, illuminated area is creeping southward. The more people use uh, uh, LED lighting, and uh, the more they install LED lighting on cars. Uh, I try to campaign against outdoor LED lighting, but I'm fighting a losing battle on that. Uh, in addition, we also have Western New York weather and humidity, and uh, that's never good. Uh, the uh, uh, nighttime cloud cover uh, is, uh, you know, averaged over the course of the year uh, about 70 percent. And, you know, truly clear sky in Western New York is, is quite unusual. And when you get it, uh, you better use it. So that's one good reason for uh, uh, installing remote observation, quite apart from uh, uh, you know, keeping the driving down and coping with, uh, with pandemics. Uh, being able to use clear sky, transparent sky, especially good seeing transparent sky as it occurs is, uh, is very important. Uh, so you know, we're, we're often covered by uh, uh, clouds. Even when we're covered by, when we're not covered by clouds, the transparency is not, you know, brilliant. The uh, the truly clear skies are way over here on the right hand side, uh, uh, where we get, you know, like a couple of nights a year of, of really clear, uh, uh, what an astronomer would call photometric conditions, and uh, about as many uh, nights of. Uh, of truly good seeing where where uh, the uh, where we would be tempted to use the uh, smallest binning on all of our images instead of just the uh, uh, luminous image. Two arc seconds seeing is about right here. And that's uh, uh, roughly speaking at the uh, uh, 12th and 13th percentile of the, of the nights we get. Uh, and the, uh, we could probably do better on that if we uh, felled some more trees, but uh, uh, there's a, uh, you know, a rate at which we can do that. And we're, we are working on it. Uh, many of you, uh, I see as I glance down the list, uh, are familiar with uh, our site supervisor at Mies, uh, Kurt Holmes. And uh, uh, Kurt has uh, adopted one of my pet projects, which is uh, cut down all the trees <laughs> near the uh, telescope. And uh, whenever he gets a, a chance and any spare money that facilities will give him, uh, uh, he's been felling trees. And those of you who have been on tours and leading tours have noticed that the, uh, the view to the south in particular has, been, has benefited from this. But there's a benefit to this from uh, the seeing viewpoint too, if you can keep turbulence down uh, in and around the dome. And we've uh, done our best for that inside the dome, but now we're limited by uh, uh, everything that goes on outside the dome, like uh, 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 wind getting stirred up by uh, uh, blowing through trees. Uh, you know, it, uh, if we get rid of the trees, we'll get rid of some of that and th that will make the images a little bit clearer. And uh, you know, it's, it's true that Gannett Hill is the highest point around, but it's just not the highest point around by very much. And, and uh, most uh, of the observatories that you've uh, uh, experienced in the West are on uh, more isolated and higher peaks. So that the site is the it is the most important thing to get right. We're we're you know doing our best on that, but uh, 
everything else helps us cope with what we get from uh, the uh, from Western New York weather. And you know, we've we have been managing, uh, especially with remote observations, to get uh, the uh, students uh, through their uh, their observing projects and even in between semesters to. Uh, uh, try out various things, uh, 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 largely because of the efforts of the folks at, at RIT, like uh, uh, Don Figer's grad students and uh, Zora Ninkoff's grad students. So to enable that, what do you, what do you need to do? Uh, the next most important thing to do, which was uh, 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 probably the uh, fourth thing that we, we actually got going, is uh, the internet connection. Uh, we, we started doing uh, remote observations when uh, we were, when we still had a satellite link. Uh, that doesn't work, by the way. Never try to do uh, uh, telescope control or camera control with a, with a, uh, uh, with a satellite uh, uh, internet connection. The latency is just uh, too large. It takes about 1.8 seconds to get a, a signal from the ground up to a geosynchronous satellite and back down again. Uh, uh, so uh, this, as soon as we could, we ditched that and started pointing uh, antennas at the local cell towers. And after uh, learning that uh, Verizon had no interest whatsoever in working with us and making things better, we, uh, uh, we called in a marker uh, and learned that we could get uh, AT&T FirstNet wireless connections. Uh, AT&T FirstNet uh, is offered to first responders uh, and they promise never to throttle it and always to offer their highest uh, uh, wireless bandwidths. And the reason we get to use it is that uh, A, we have a medical center <laughs> and B, uh, we also host uh, uh, a relay at Mies in uh, one of the rooms. If you if you've been to Mies recently and can visualize the door that you see on your right as soon as you walk into the dome, in there is a bunch of electronics for the uh, Mercy Flight system. It relays uh, signals from uh, the southern tier and pass that in uh, 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 West Central Pennsylvania. Uh, to uh, the helicopter control at Strong Memorial Hospital. Uh, uh, so we pitched that and AT&T said, oh, thank you for your service. Here's your first net um, uh, wireless connection. And I, I felt really badly about that. <laughs> Whose uh, hardware the uh, Mercy Flight system is and at least took them into our internet connection. <laughs> uh, uh, so we have a, uh, the, the best uh, wireless connection that, um, that money can buy. Uh, it turns out to be served by a five band uh, cell tower on near the top of Sid Hill. And uh, these two uh, Yagi antennas uh, that you'll notice, well, it's kind of hard to see in this uh, uh, perspective, but you'll, uh, you'll probably believe me when I say that the planes of these uh, 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 triangles are perpendicular to one another. Uh, those are pointed at that uh, cell tower. Uh, uh, the basic requirements are that if uh, the uh, 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 upload or download uh, uh, bandwidth is or uh, rates are less than about 10 megabits per second, or the latency less th uh, greater than about uh, 0.8. Uh, uh, 1.0 uh, uh, seconds, uh, then uh, lots of problems will result in your uh, uh, attempts to control the telescope. Our connection usually has uh, uh, 60 megabits per second up, 120 megabits per second down. Uh, you'll notice that this is faster than uh, the, uh, uh, the basic uh, cable uh, internet uh, uh, rates. And uh, 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 less than 50 millisecond latency. Uh, when you add a secure B VPN, both of these rates come down to something like 40 megabits per second. And if it's raining, it might be 20 or 15 or something like that, but you don't want to observe in the rain anyhow. 
all of this got installed in, uh, in uh, 2020 after having uh, uh, done the first few months of the, uh, uh, the pandemic with uh, a Verizon uh, connection in which these other uh, spars on the utility pole uh, were used for different antennas pointing at every uh, cell tower we could find uh, because uh, one of the, another one of the things that uh, Verizon doesn't do uh, uh, very well from our perspective, although they do other things well, is uh, they don't uh, multiband or enable aggregation of several bands uh, uh, very easily. Whereas uh, AT and T uh, serves uh, five bands from uh, uh, Stid Hill, we can point both of our high gain antennas there, uh, get both polarizations of the uh, of the uh, cell tower signal, and uh, we got a, a router that can aggregate five bands. And that has made things ultra reliable. Before that happened, uh, we were stuck with one band and uh, data rates that were, uh, you know, at best uh, between five and 10 megabits per second. And it was very painful to try to uh, observe remotely under those kinds of circumstances. Looking down the list again, I see some of the victims of that uh, uh, of that mode of operation. Marks here, bills here. Uh, uh, you remember how bad that was, right, guys? Uh, so anyway, that that has been a, that has been the uh, the biggest uh, major change, uh, and uh, I. I wish we had done it first. I wish we had pitched the uh, single band system and uh, gone for uh, a true uh, multiple input, multiple output, uh, uh, five band signal aggregation faster than we already did. Now the internet connection also has to be secure. And uh, by secure, I mean, uh, not just secure from intruders. We don't have very many of them trying to hack into us, but also for, uh, uh, secure from, uh, from local spectators like uh, uh, students who happen to know the passwords and, and uh, uh, don't uh, 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 don't have anything better to do than to spelunk on the uh, uh, on the system here. Uh, so we did better than that. We installed a a pretty sophisticated uh, secure VPN that is well. It still says here that it's managed by our department's internal IT staff. Uh, there was a period about a month or a month and a half ago where we were reduced to a, an internal IT staff of zero uh, uh, by uh, getting raided and uh, having retirements occur. Now we have uh, one and uh, that person is still uh, learning and he hasn't yet tackled the, uh, uh, the secure VPN. So it's, it's running uh, basically on whatever uh, milliseconds we can get out of Rich Sarkis and on what uh, uh, Kelly Douglas and I have learned about uh, uh, secure VPN setup. Uh, uh, this is important uh, from the, the security and anti-tampering and uh, uh, making sure that you uh, have only experienced users remote, remotely operating the telescope viewpoint. The VPN is the only portal to the telescope control computer, and I recommend that very strongly for those of you who are thinking of uh, remote observations. Uh, if you have credentials on the VPN, you can use remote desktop software that comes with uh, Windows or uh, uh, Mac iOS to uh, uh, gain access to the TCS. TCS means uh, telescope control system. The TCS, uh, we have it set up so that it only allows one user to log in at any given time. And that's a, a safety feature that, uh, you know, it's also the default, but it's, uh, I view it as a safety feature. The, uh, uh, it prevents unwitting observers from uh, uh, issuing uh, commands that would uh, uh, tell the telescope to do uh, uh, conflicting things. The instruments, it's not that much of a problem if it is told to do, if the camera is told to do conflicting things, it'll just crash. But the telescope, when it crashes, might crash into the horizon or something that we don't want to have happen. Uh, uh, so if I logged in now, I could show you for a few minutes until the students who are uh, using the telescope uh, figured it out, uh, uh, how the telescope uh, uh, drives around. But as soon as they figured it out, they would log in and kick me out. The last person who logged in kicks the previous person out. 
sometimes we go back and forth on this uh, when uh, when we forget to tell people that we were that we're uh, trying to do something with the telescope. Okay, uh, after internet, the important thing is uh, to have a uh, uh, a telescope control uh, system that uh, consists of a really good uh, uh, telescope mount and a pretty good enclosure. As you know, if you've been there, we have a, uh, a, a pretty good enclosure, which is uh, pretty new and uh, uh, we like it very much. Uh, what you might not realize because of all the, the paint chipping on the uh, surface is that we also, also have a really uh, stable massive uh, uh, telescope mount. And that's a big help because it makes the, uh, the job of the uh, uh, computer when it's trying to auto guide the telescope a lot easier. Our mount is uh, an ancient prehistoric Baller and Chivins equatorial mount and it's uh, run with uh, real live gears, uh, uh, some of which are even uh, geared down and run uh, dials that sit on the front of the uh, of this uh, disc that you see from the side over here near the bottom of the telescope. Uh, those of you who have uh, uh, run and been on tours at Mies have seen those uh, dials. It's for remote observations that has been crucial because that is an encoder independent uh, ground truth for which way is the telescope pointing. If the system crashes, which it uh, does despite everybody's best efforts, you have to have something to tell you, uh, you know, where the telescope is pointing. And the only thing that can do that reliably is a, uh, uh, a dial system that's geared into the uh, telescope. So we have that, and that is one of the, the, the best things about our, uh, our Buller and Chivins mount. Uh, along with that, it's, you know, it weighs tons, literally. It's very stable. It has very small periodic errors, and the periodic errors are well within the uh, scope of the grasp of the uh, uh, the auto guider. It's a lot better than anything that uh, you can get for, from a, a small portable telescope. Although I suspect there are mounts at Ionia that uh, are uh, equivalently good and wouldn't have wouldn't offer very much more trouble to an auto guider system. Uh, this is one of the uh, uh, drawings uh, that the original purchasers of this system got from uh, uh, Baller and Chivins. Uh, uh, as you can see, the polar axis is pointing like this, and the telescope is laying right underneath the uh, polar axis, and observers are forbidden from ever putting it in that situation. In fact, uh, that's one of the few things that the, uh, the uh, uh, telescope control software is rigorously booby-trapped against. But you can defeat the software, and uh, uh, thus, uh, after the software is defeated, uh, only the rule of law prevents uh, people from doing this. Uh, now, uh, you know, here I go again, looking down the, the list. You've all looked through this telescope, and you know what it is. Uh, it's a 24-inch uh, 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 Cassegrain telescope. The primary mirror was made by Kirk and Elmer for the uh, uh, Stratoscope program. Uh, uh, while the Stratoscope program in the early 60s was running, uh, and uh, the uh, CEO of Kirk and Elmer uh, discovered that uh, his company was making these uh, horrendously uh, over-specified uh, primary mirrors in a 24 inch size, and you could buy a, a mount and tube for a 24 inch uh, telescope from uh, Bowler and Chivins. He bought one and uh, grabbed another one of these um, mirrors and uh, installed it on his uh, palatial estate in uh, Connecticut. Uh, so it's, uh, I suppose that's still there. One of these days I'm going to have to figure out where that is and whether one can buy it from spare parts. Uh, uh, it's f13.5, plate scale is 25 uh, in round numbers, arc seconds per millimeter at the cast focus down here, about a foot from the back of the, uh, 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 from the back of the back plate of the telescope. And the collecting area is about 2,700 uh, square centimeters. This is another uh, Bowler and Chivins drawing of an exploded view of the uh, uh, telescope. 
the uh, uh, primary mirror we got for free because uh, uh, Stuart Sharpless uh, uh, talked the stratoscope program out of the, the uh, primary mirror. And it is horrendously overspecified. It was made for uh, uh, very high altitude balloon observations, uh, high enough altitude that the seeing is uh, way, way, way sub arc second. Uh, so it's practically diffraction limited at visible wavelengths, uh, uh, even in the middle of the visible band. But of course, we never get there in Western New York. So, the, so it's a better primary mirror than we need. Uh, but it was free. Now, uh, this is all protected by an ash dome. Here's the, uh, the new dome in uh, various states of, of completion out on the, uh, the uh, summit clearing at Mies uh, when uh, the ash people were, uh, were there building it. And in the background in uh, this uh, second image here, you can see the uh, domeless uh, 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 building at Mies with uh, uh, these spars over the top of it to hold up the things that were keeping the rain from getting to the telescope. This was put in in 2014. It replaced the original Astrodome, and the original Astrodome is now gracing one of the telescopes in Ionia. The nice thing about the Ash Dome, which was, which as you've noticed, if you've been in the in the Astrodome, uh, is not a property of the Astrodome, is that uh, uh, ASH comes with uh, controls and software that track the orientation of the telescope mount. So you no longer have to run up to the uh, uh, dome floor and move the dome when, you're, uh, when you've tracked too far. And uh, uh, next, uh, and probably more in importance, uh, uh, a, uh, uh, a DFM engineering uh, telescope control system. DFM retrofits uh, uh, lots of telescopes, and they build their own telescopes and mounts too. But among their business items is uh, is uh, uh, retrofitting Bowler and Shivin's uh, early and mid '60s telescopes for modern operation. And we are lucky they are uh, uh, still doing that. We got our first upgrade from them uh, uh, in 2001, the next one in 2014, and the most recent one in uh, 2019, which was a major uh, uh, replacement of a lot of the electronics that, in the box that you can see to the right of the seat down there. Uh, among the, uh, uh, the improvements, not all of which are convenient improvements, is that uh, the communication is, not, is now uh, uh, via ASCOM uh, telescope commands. And uh, lots of uh, telescopes that you can buy these days uh, run under that kind of protocol. Uh, uh, it's a little bit inconvenient uh, with certain uh, uh, software. Uh, as you'll see in a minute, we use uh, the Sky 10 as uh, our user interface system. And uh, the Sky 10 uh, is configured so that it uh, uh, does not do handshakes. It does not wait for a for a uh, 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 a closing command to come back from the telescope system before it issues another one. So, for example, if you want to uh, instruct the telescope to uh, uh, offset a certain amount in RA and a certain amount in DEC, you have to do that with separate commands. You can't do it uh, uh, with uh, both commands, even though the the, uh, uh, the system provides you a way of putting in uh, two dimensions of offsets. So there, there are some inconveniences to ASCOM, but overall the, uh, the uh, conveniences outweigh them. Uh, DFM also provides good tools to model and refine the pointing accuracy of the telescope. And that uh, is uh, an infinitely deep rabbit hole. Next, you need uh, good instruments. Uh, you need at least a large format CCD camera and uh, all the trimmings. Uh, uh, having just stated it, CCD cameras and looking down the list again, I, I bet there are several of you wondering why I'm so old fashioned as to insist on CCD cameras because everybody is using uh, CMOS cameras now. And uh, you know, such luminaries as uh, the Santa Barbara Instrument Group, SBIG, has uh, discontinued its uh, amateur-oriented CCD camera line. The reason for this is that, uh, again, we have a, a decent-sized telescope, 
and uh, we cannot turn down time just because the moon is out. And CMOS cameras have very shallow depth of wells. You can't integrate for very long uh, on a uh, uh, on a CMOS camera if the uh, uh, if the background is high. Uh, that's going to be a limitation to uh, sensitivity. The well depth, the number of uh, electrons that can be stored up before the image saturates, is ten times higher on a CCD on a good CCD camera than it is on a CMOS camera. So it's uh, even though C CMOS cameras are starting to uh, catch up with uh, CCDs in quantum efficiency, uh, there are still uh, creature features about them that do not uh, go well with, uh, uh, with observations from telescopes like ours. So we're still happy with our, our CCD cameras. And uh, uh, the local connection that goes well with that is that our CCD cameras are, are good local products. They're, uh, they're both, uh, uh, we have two main cameras that one, camera one was bought in 2014, camera two in 2019. They both have uh, 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 chips in them that were, uh, that came off of the Kodak uh, KAF, F just means uh, uh, full frame uh, download, 16803, which are 16 megapixel uh, CCDs. And uh, the one in camera number one was actually made by Kodak. The one in camera number two was made by On, uh, in the same lab that made the uh, uh, the the first one, but different people. And I regret to say that it doesn't work as well as the one in camera number one. Uh, now the uh, uh, they cover twenty two arc minute diagonal square field, uh, uh, and that comes pretty close to filling the uh, telescope's unvignetted field of view. And that's another thing you should uh, strive to do if you're uh, getting a camera uh, and want to make the, uh, the most efficient use of the, uh, uh, of the observing conditions and the telescope. You should fill as much of the, uh, uh, the field of view as you can. Fortunately, CCDs and CMOS detectors come in squares and uh, unvignetted fields of view are round. So that leaves these little crescents on the edge for you to, uh, to put uh, 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 auto guider detectors in. And that's where our auto guider detectors live. So uh, we have auto guider detectors that are built into the CC, to the uh, uh, SBIG cameras, but we have uh, 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 one that can uh, that is uh, further up the optical train in front of the filters that uh, we uh, normally use when camera number two is on. Uh, uh, I guess that uh, about covers this one, except for the uh, uh, instrument rotator. Oh, I, I guess I forgot to mention that uh, if one thing that uh, comes with having uh, a separate off-axis auto guider is that uh, SBIG's uh, separate off-axis auto guider comes with a, uh, a field lens in front of it that uh, increases its field of view by a factor of about uh, two. And uh, that has been pretty handy as well. Uh, all of this currently is uh, hangs from the telescope uh, from an instrument rotator that uh, we put on when we did the last uh, major uh, uh, TCS upgrade. And that can move the imager and auto guiders to different orientations. And uh, we can now guarantee that no matter where it is you're pointing in the sky, there are suitable guide stars. And uh, all of these uh, systems are capable of auto guiding undisturbed for hours. You know, unless a, a totally opaque cloud blows by, which of course happens because this is Western New York, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the telescope will stay put guiding the object to uh, better than the seeing uh, uh, for hours and hours. And that's of course crucial for, uh, for very long duration exposures. Uh, but uh, CCDs and uh, CMOS too uh, are like all sensitive detectors of light uh, incapable of discerning one color from another. So uh, the, uh, in between the, uh, the rotator and the uh, off-axis auto guider and the camera itself, there needs to be a wheel full of filters. 
This is what the filter wheel for camera number two looked like uh, before about oh, uh, January 24th. Now the now the L filter has been pulled out and replaced with an H beta filter uh, so that we have uh, uh, four spectral lines here uh, using H alpha and H beta to measure uh, extinction towards H2 regions. Uh, uh, so, you know, uh, we have our two cameras, each of them has their own dedicated filter wheel and they each have a, uh, uh, a large number of uh, filters to choose from. Uh, filters used by astronomers these days, uh, uh, you are familiar with if you've tried to buy one recently, are not made of colored glass. They're made, uh, they're much more expensive than that. They're made of, uh, of multi-layer dielectric coatings. Uh, and uh, that's why the uh, narrowband ones look uh, particularly shiny. They're practically mirror finish uh, and mirror reflection because the only thing allowed to uh, transmit through those is a very narrow uh, uh, wavelength range of light. Whereas uh, the broadband filters like uh, B, G, and R here uh, reflect light that uh, does turn out to be colored. And uh, of course, because uh, the B filter transmits uh, blue, it re reflects yellow. And because the red filter transmits uh, red, it reflects blue and so on and so forth. Uh, and all of these live about an inch in front of the CCD. And uh, a, a little while ago, uh, Dave was showing some pictures of, uh, of uh, supernova images in which uh, uh, Nick pointed out uh, some uh, dust spots. Uh, you, uh, with this many surfaces in front of the, uh, 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 the telescope, you can actually distinguish between uh, which surface the, the dust is on by the size of the dust donut. Uh, so, you know, I know when uh, I have to dust the filter wheel. And uh, because there's a window in front of the CCD, I never have to dust the uh, CCD. Here's what uh, camera number two looks like, and that's what's on the back of the telescope right now. Uh, uh, it's got a, a remote control uh, cap that will uh, uh, cover the entrance to the whole business down here. Uh, uh, at the bottom, there's uh, camera number two, CCD camera. There's filter wheel number two. Here's the offset auto guider that, that picks off light in one of those crescents on the edge of the field of view and uh, reflects it uh, sideways and feeds uh, a, um, uh, a KAI uh, 340 uh, uh, CCD over here for uh, auto guider purposes. And here's the rotator. The rotator is an Optech uh, Pixis, uh, you know, commercial product. It's worked very well for us. Uh, uh, Camera number two looks almost the same from about here down, except as most of you are familiar with, it bolts to the bottom of the black box that has the uh, eyepiece mount on it and the diagonal mirror that can be swung back and forth to choose between the eyepiece and uh, camera number one. Uh, camera number one's uh, filter wheel has uh, only five filters in it uh, uh, because they're bigger filters. Uh, because uh, camera number one can only auto guide by the built-in uh, uh, CCD chip that is mounted right next to the great big main uh, CCD chip. Uh, so it has, it has to be bigger so that light can get to the side-by-side uh, the, the -side CCD. Those kinds of filters are getting very expensive, uh, as you may have noticed if you tried to buy filters lately. Uh, uh, the, uh, the companies that make filters like uh, 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 like Botter Planetarium and uh, the, the secret vendor that Diffraction Limited gets its filters from uh, are uh, starting to go for the market of uh, very fast optical systems uh, in which uh, they have to uh, 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 make their layers quite a bit more uniform and defect free than they used to. They call these uh, CMOS optimized filters and they'll charge you three times as much as they used to. Uh, we can still use those, but uh, uh, they cost three times as much. And so who wants to pay that? Uh, so th this is camera system number two. Camera system number one, you have probably seen with your own eyes. We have a spectrograph too that actually has a couple of uh, uh, 
It's a Shellyak uh, high res uh, 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 grading spectrograph that has a couple of other uh, CCD cameras hanging from it. Uh, and I will not discuss that tonight because it, uh, we are still uh, reconfiguring it to uh, recommission it on the telescope and enable uh, uh, more spectroscopy experiments for the uh, students. Uh, next thing on the list is you have to do surveillance if you're going to be doing uh, uh, remote observation. We have to have real-time monitoring of conditions outside and inside the observatory. And when we see something wrong, we have to be able to fix almost everything by uh, uh, what we see in the uh, video cameras. And by fix, I usually mean uh, power cycling something because the, of course that's how we fix everything. Uh, uh, and uh, that has uh, 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 led us to uh, the discovery of some uh, really quite good uh, uh, remote control power switches that I'll tell you about in a minute. But anyway, we have a, uh, we have uh, a weather station because, uh, as you know from living in western New York, it's often not the case that satellite weather reports and satellite images tell you the whole system. We have the satellite weather reports and we have the observatory's uh, uh, encoders uh, and we need those, but we actually also need uh, local weather conditions, particularly uh, uh, measurements of uh, of relative humidity, which uh, the satellite images and the weather channel will not uh, reliably tell us. So we have uh, a weather station also mounted on this utility pole. Remember over here uh, where I'm waving my cursor, those are the uh, Yagi antennas that uh, provide our uh, 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 internet connection. And uh, this thing over here and the uh, anemometer that you can see projecting from the top of it and the wind vane at the very top of that, that's our uh, 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 Davis weather station, uh, weather station. Uh, Davis, uh, what is Davis's real name? I think it's Davis controls or something like that. Uh, if you Google Davis and weather station, you'll, uh, you'll see this thing. It's been very good for us. We've had it for several years now. Uh, it is uh, uh, pretty well sealed from the elements, and uh, it has it has never failed in action. It uh, comes with a box that uh, that goes inside the the uh, the building too. Uh, you can get cheap uh, versions of these things if you if you are inside a building that is not a Faraday cage uh, like ours is. Uh, so this uh, weather station is actually connected uh, with a real live uh, set of wires that go down this conduit here and go underneath the driveway and up to the, the uh, electronics feed through box on the outside of the observatory building and then into the uh, uh, control room. Uh, this is what we pay for having a, uh, an electronically quiet uh, uh, region inside the dome. Uh, the building is covered with metal, so uh, uh, we can't receive a wireless uh, signal from outside. But uh, so this wound up costing twice as much as a, a wireless system, but uh, I think it's I think it's worth it from the electronic quietude inside. Uh, also, we have video cameras uh, mounted uh, inside and out. Uh, you can uh, uh, no doubt that there are. Uh, uh, video cameras surveilling various things at Ionia too. Uh, if you got any of them from Zosi, throw them away and get uh, and get better ones because they're going to break uh, in the next couple of months anyway. Uh, uh, we got uh, you know not the cheapest we can find, but uh, the uh, uh, next cheapest we could find, and we got a uh, video camera handler from Lorex. Uh, which is an American company. It's actually built in uh, the Finger Lakes. Uh, and uh, Lorex Cloud uh, serves uh, the, uh, 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 the signals uh, pretty well and uh, offers a couple of apps that, uh, that work reasonably well. Uh, uh, the ones that are inside the dome, uh, and you know, the tendency is just, you know, since the cameras themselves are fairly cheap and the Lorex controller can handle 16 of them, to sprinkle uh, uh, cameras everywhere uh, you would possibly want to look. 
that should be resisted because uh, CCDs and CMOS can both uh, sense uh, infrared light that can be uh, produced by the illuminators that come with these uh, cameras for night vision. So we only have uh, uh, four of them currently mounted inside the dome. And I'm gonna turn one of those off next time I go up there. Uh, I don't think it's currently detectable by our system, but you know, we'll always have to keep this in mind. Here's what the uh, camera output uh, uh, looks like on a, uh, on a balmy day in the fall, I guess. Uh, uh, one of the cameras is pointing at the dials. Remember I told you that, the, uh, uh, that having these dials geared into the telescope was a supreme advantage. Uh, and uh, that is really a, uh, a handy thing when things crash as they inevitably will. Uh, uh, there is some uh, uh, parallax here, but uh, those of you who are familiar with the telescope can see that it is indeed by the dials pointing at the zenith. And uh, sure enough, uh, here's the upper part of the telescope tube also pointing at the zenith and the lower part of the telescope tube coincidentally pointing at the zenith. And uh, 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 right here, this bright spot you can see here is another camera whose body I'm pointing at with the tip of this arrow right here. That is pointing back down towards the, uh, uh, towards the ground and its purpose is to be able to see from the control room whether you accidentally left the ladder in the way uh, uh, if you've been uh, if you're observing in person and uh, or, uh, forgot to move it out of the way uh, in your haste to go up and down stairs. Uh, that's the one that I'm going to unplug because in remote obs observations we don't really uh, need that and all it can do is uh, is scatter light around the dome. There's a uh, 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 th this camera, camera number two, is pointed uh, as close to the uh, top of the dome as uh, was convenient at the time. It is very convenient to be able to have this view so that you can see the upper shutter disappear past this edge here when it's opening because we can't hear anything that's going on. As you know, if you've been to Mies, and all of you have been to Mies, uh, uh, one of the good ways of, of uh, noticing what's going on if you're uh, starting up the telescope is that you can hear the, the doors go past. And that is missing from, uh, uh, from remote observations. We should really put a, a, a microphone out here too. Uh, in both this view and camera four's view, uh, we can see the uh, uh, lower shutter open, which swings uh, uh, outwards. And if it's not too dark, uh, we can see it swing outwards in uh, the uh, outside camera view too. Uh, uh, a better view of, uh, of the state of the uh, uh, outer, of the lower shutter though from the outer camera is that the outer camera can see the, uh, uh, the inner camera's illumination of the uh, inside of the dome. Uh, because it, the inner cameras use the same kind of, uh, of uh, infrared illuminators that the outer camera does. Uh, I'm going to try to do something about, uh, well, uh, actually Kurt already figured out what to do about the, the rope. I don't want to eliminate the rope because it's way too useful. Uh, but uh, uh, the uh, illuminator here uh, just uh, reflects way too much light off of the back side of the, uh, uh, sorry, off the front side of the, uh, uh, the telescope's pancake there. Finally, we had to automate all the uh, power and ancillary systems. Uh, no longer do we ever uh, uh, go up to the uh, telescope, park it in the service position and yank the telescope cover off by hand because now we have a remote control uh, 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 telescope cover that works just as well from the uh, control room as it does remotely. Uh, uh, that's what you can see up here. Uh, this is version one of this system. And again, you can see that the infrared illuminator, it's dark inside the dome when this picture was taken. This is a, a a, uh, a, a video camera picture, and you can see how bright this infrared illuminator is that's shining from this uh, 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 camera. 
Uh, this is uh, maximum open, and at the moment it leans back five degrees away from the, uh, uh, the side of the telescope. Uh, we thought at first that that was going to be fine until we started uh, uh, observing for real remotely and discovered that uh, this makes uh, uh, for a pretty good sail. And uh, we observe uh, in the south so much, and we have southwest winds so much, that uh, the, uh, the telescope gets blown around with a lot, extra, a lot of extra uh, 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 force and torque because of the way the wind uh, hits the, uh, the uh, remote control cover. So version two is going to uh, uh, have uh, a, a sprocket wheel up here on the, where the, uh, the cover hinges and uh, a, a mini bike chain uh, uh, sort of thing that leads down to a motor uh, uh, mounted further down the tube that can uh, move the, uh, uh, the, the telescope cover all the way back flush to the telescope dome uh, to, keep, to keep it from serving as a shield, as a, as a sail and as, a, uh, as all the other things that it does. So that, we, that, we, uh, uh, that was an important part of this. You have to have a remote control cover if you're going to re observe remotely. Uh, on the back side of this cover, the side that you can't see, is also uh, a, a continuous, uh, and this was not easy to find either, uh, an electroluminescent panel. Uh, electroluminescent panels are uh, uh, basically uh, 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 plastics that glow almost exactly white uh, under the application of high voltage. Uh, almost exactly white and being very uniform is the prescription for what you want for, uh, for a flat field. If you place such a thing across the entrance to the telescope and turn it on, uh, you'll get a very, very good uh, uh, flat field image at the, uh, in the focal plane of your uh, CCD or CMOS camera. So that's the way we do it now. And we've tested this numerous times against uh, the classic way to do this, which is uh, uh, looking at uh, uh, twilight sky. Uh, the, the flat field from the uh, lamp, the electroluminescent panel is at least as good as uh, the twilight sky and has a, a supreme virtue, which uh, one of Zorin's uh, uh, previous students was uh, uh, putting to good use, which is that the electroluminous, electroluminescent panel is not polarized and the twilight sky is. And Dimitri, uh, 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 Zorin's student, uh, had a polarimeter. So he did not like uh, doing uh, flat fields on twilight sky. So this has been a, a, a big improvement and uh, it was cheap too. The, uh, uh, all the parts for this were uh, you know, about 500 bucks. And that includes the high voltage power supply for the electroluminescent panel and uh, the uh, uh, linear actuator that uh, uh, pulls the, uh, uh, this lever back to open the door. We've also uh, 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 installed a bunch of uh, 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 computer controlled AC switches. It turns out that there is a, a, a nice company you can still buy such things from. Uh, and uh, uh, I would recommend the ones we got to anybody who's interested in computer controlling any AC switches because they're, they've been uh, faultless and the software that came with them is both easy to use and uh, causes very little trouble. We also have an uninterruptible power supply uh, in the control room that backs up the, uh, the telescope control system computer itself. Uh, and it can be used to cycle the power to everything in the uh, uh, telescope control system and everything else we can power cycle uh, using these uh, computer controlled AC switches. Uh, the uh, TCS and the uh, uh, router uh, can be rebooted remotely, but we never want those shut off. So those are, uh, those are only backed up uh, by the, uh, uh, the UPS. And in fact, I can, re I can uh, turn the UPS on and off remotely as well. 
So that's about it. The re result is that except for the things that are outside of our control, like site quality and 24-inch uh, telescopes and, and so forth, Mies winds up being outfitted very similarly and operates very similarly to large telescopes that are used in uh, astronomical research. So uh, our students get to learn to observe on a professionally outfitted uh, telescope. Uh, they have more access to the telescope than they used to because uh, now, you know, nothing is sacred. Anytime it looks like uh, there's usable sky, uh, uh, we can uh, cajole somebody into using it if we're not actually using it ourselves. Uh, so that's a big uh, uh, plus side, and that has been supremely important during the pandemic. Uh, uh, because during the pandemic, we couldn't, you know, the rules prevented us from taking the, the students to the observatory. The only al alternative to remote observation would have been calling off all of the observing uh, uh, components of our classes. So it's a, it's a very efficient way to uh, operate. It also is all the more efficient because nobody uh, ever has to travel to the telescope unless they really want to observe in person, which, uh, you know, lots of people still do, of course, not me, but because uh, 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 I've done enough of that. But, uh, 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 you know, in-person observations are still possible and the students have to experience that at some point. But uh, 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 the way we have it set up now with the remote access, uh, it is, uh, it has been the case for uh, a year and a half and almost two that hardly any clear sky has gone to waste. Uh, and uh, uh, thus, we've had four classes now that use, well, five if you count the uh, graduate uh, apparition of uh, Astronomy 244, uh, four uh, 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 classes uh, that have significant enrollments going continuously throughout the pandemic. Uh, and that would have been impossible for uh, uh, for us to do without remote observations. For example, uh, Astronomy 106 here. Astronomy 106 is a, uh, a non-science major oriented class. Uh, uh, it's uh, uh, usually bigger than all of our other classes. Uh, and it would have been impossible to uh, include a, uh, an observing component to this non-science major class during a pandemic without uh, remote access, but uh, with remote access, it turned out to work perfectly fine. Uh, uh, and uh, even better than that, uh, we managed to keep, uh, although the, uh, during 2020, when the pandemic uh, first broke out, we uh, basically gave up and called everything off. But last year, as many of you are uh, familiar with, we kept our public tours going by having uh, uh, highly trained uh, uh, tour guides run the telescope remotely and offered the tours remotely. And uh, that uh, still had uh, uh, high attendance and uh, good reviews. Uh, this has a downside too, because, well, from the viewpoint of, uh, of education and outreach, uh, any research involvement involves a downside. Uh, uh, but the uh, fact that it's remotely accessible has meant that more interest has developed within the research groups at uh, U of R and RIT to uh, uh, keep the telescope accessible uh, uh, for new instruments uh, uh, to shake down at Mies before taking them to a larger telescope. Uh, uh, that's about it. Basically, uh, internet connection, a nice mount, uh, a good camera that has good software that comes with it, and creature features like uh, being able to cycle power remotely uh, and open the cover remotely. Uh, that's, uh, that's what really uh, makes uh, uh, the difference. And uh, I hope you've noticed that, uh, first of all, that makes uh, 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 Mies a lot more uh, usable. And second, that I hope you uh, uh, take note of this usability in case uh, uh, you have ideas that uh, Mies can be put to for, uh, uh, for uh, fun things. And third, that uh, there are uh, telescopes at uh, Ionia that could be similarly equipped. 
So there you are. Have we questions about any of this? Any questions, anybody? Let's see. Yeah. Hey, Mark. Hey, Bill. Hey, just I had a question. What What is it about that configuration of the scope that makes it forbidden? The one that was in that, that drawing. Oh, uh, it, uh, uh, it doesn't do the mechanicals any harm, but it drives the, uh, uh, the telescope control system crazy when the, uh, uh, the telescope is slewed so that it's pointing below the pole. Uh, th this is uh, uh, common to equatorial uh, computer controlled mounts. It's, it, it, uh, it has to do with, uh, with uh, the, uh, uh, the fact that the uh, hour angle wraps around uh, and uh, uh, not all of the telescope controls are booby trapped against uh, the hour angle wrapping around inappropriately. Yeah, I've never seen the scope upside down like that. It's, it's kind of and, unusual and, to see the picture like that. Yeah, and you and you won't. It's a good show. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I pulled up the Lorex cloud I have on my phone. I don't know if you guys can yeah, see. Good, good question. Yeah, good question though, Bill. That's it, that. It, uh, it, it is not obvious why that should be forbidden. This isn't this isn't working well. But I pulled up the Lorex cloud. You can't see it because of my <laughs> background. I get to get rid of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's it's your invisibility cloak. Yeah, it's an invisibility screen. <laughs> but, yeah, all, uh, yeah, all all of us have a uh, 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 Lorex cloud on our phones, and that's handy too. That uh, that we can we can glance at what uh, and at what is going on, uh, and uh, many problems have been solved thereby. So Mark can do that. Uh, Carol can do that. Uh, all of our uh, all of our aces can do that. So have there been any interesting instruments that have been shaken down on the scope since it's been uh, automated? Well, we had a really interesting one that didn't make it on in the fall. Uh, uh, Don Feiger has a uh, 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 a series of uh, photon counting cameras that uh, well. We call them cameras, but their their uh, field of view is actually pretty dinky uh, because uh, wide field is not what these things are for if they're counting photons. Uh, uh, that uh, you know weighs literally a ton. Well, no, half a ton. And uh, wow. uh, uh, just like some of the things that Zoran Minkov has put on the telescope require. Uh, not just taking all the weights off the back, but, uh, but uh, hanging weights off the uh, other side of the telescope too. And uh, that will be pretty interesting when it finally gets uh, uh, shaken down. Uh, the big instrument with the, uh, you know, uh, cryogenic cooling and the full uh, blown cryogenic uh, 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 filter wheels and things like that are, they've been to the telescope once and uh, enough things went wrong that they just took it right back off the telescope and took it back to the lab. But the smaller version of the same photon counting camera without the cooling <coughs> has been up there a few times in the hands of, uh, of Don's grad student, Lazar Buntic. Uh, and uh, 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 that provided enough data to get Lazar his uh, uh, qualifying exam done this month. So uh, yeah, photon counting cameras are, uh, are an interesting new development for uh, doing very faint things with very high time resolution. So, you know, spectral lines in, uh, in, uh, in uh, rapidly variable objects, for example, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, low mass X-ray binaries or uh, other things that have black holes in them. That's cool. So yeah, uh, they uh, uh, you know Don is never short of ideas uh, and has uh, uh, other things to uh, put on them uh, on on Mies uh, along those lines, but this one's going to be the first one uh, in his new line. And uh, meanwhile, uh, uh, Zoran's group has uh, Ritmos, which is this really cool thing that uh, uses one of the uh, uh, micro mirror arrays like they have in the focal planes of JWST. 
uh, uh, Zorin got some of these chips and reverse engineered them so that he could figure out how to uh, uh, manipulate the micromirrors and uh, 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 the, uh, taught the micromirrors how to have two positions, one of which reflects to a, uh, uh, a camera input. So he takes an image of a star cluster, say, and uh, figures out which, which the stars are that, that are the most interesting at the moment and uh, identifies those to the micromirror array and tells them to uh, 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 slew over in their other orientation. And in their other orientation, it takes the starlight uh, from that star and uh, feeds uh, a grading spectrograph. Oh, fantastic. That's cool. It, it's, it's, it's very cool. Uh, so that, that instrument has been on the telescope several times. And let's see, what else is there? Uh, uh, the, uh, he has another relatively new student, Lexi Irwin, who is uh, uh, doing uh, a compact camera that's gonna have another one of these uh, voltage tunable uh, uh, filters in front of it that uh, uh, I guess the, uh, uh, I guess the main attraction of this is it's a CID array, a charge injection device which is, uh, as you might have gathered from the uh, uh, acronym, uh, uh, has some of the best parts of CCDs in them in terms of high sensitivity and uh, 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 low crosstalk and things like that. But some of the virtues of, uh, of CMOS in it as well, in the sense that uh, uh, pixels can be independently addressable without resetting them. Interesting. Uh, so it's a... Uh, 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 so there's lots of interest in these kinds of fancy detectors and fancy uh, instruments uh, at RIT. There would be more interest from uh, uh, U of R groups too, except uh, most of the U of R groups are working on infrared uh, uh, sensors and instruments. And there's not really much these can do for, the, for those groups uh, unless uh, they're willing to settle for 1.2 and 1.6 microns. Right. Uh, this is Dave Bishop. Uh, Don is our speaker for next month. Yeah. And he's going to be talking on uh, some of the work he did with James Webb. Maybe we should ask him to talk about some of the other instruments that he's put up there. Yeah, ask him to talk about photon counting cameras because that's really cool. <laughs> Uh, you know, every, you know, by, you know, JWST has launched, right? So nobody cares about it anymore. At least at NASA, they don't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you should get Don to talk about the future. You know, this is, this is part of the future. Interesting. Uh, um, I have a question. You mentioned that uh, uh, internet access is really important. Um, what, yes. do, what do what other observatories do that are even really remote? Do they have, do they, some you know, they bring in a fiber optic all the way to the top of, you know, Mauna Kea or, or the Atacama Desert or, or what, what, do, what, do they, what do other places do for internet access? They bite the bullet and pay uh, huge gobs of money to run fiber cable. Uh, uh, we could do that too. I mean, the uh, uh, fiber is about halfway up uh, uh, South Gannett Hill Road at the moment. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, South Gannett Hill Road, the one that leads from uh, uh, South Bristol up the hill. It's about halfway up the hill right now. Uh, it started off, you know, way down in the in the valley. Uh, ever since I started asking, which is about 15 years ago, the price has been the same for extending it up to the uh, dome. It's been two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Ouch. So, uh, you know, the next time we have a spare quarter million dollars, we'll run a uh, fiber cable to the, uh, the dome. That would be much better because, uh, uh, you know, there are times when you want to uh, do stuff uh, on the telescope control system when it's raining or snowing and the, uh, the wireless connection just isn't very good. When the trees are wet, the wireless connection is lousy. Yeah. You don't want to observe when that it, it's exactly terrible for, for other reasons. But, uh, it's a uh, 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 you know some some of you like Mark and Bill who were who were uh, uh, Bill Rogers. There I see there are several Bills now uh, 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 who have who have experienced this firsthand. 
I remember going up to the telescope one night when everything was wet and everybody else was back in the classroom uh, uh, working and we just, you know, even my phone wasn't working very well. Uh, it, that was, those days are, are past us, but uh, 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 the, uh, uh, you know, a buried cable is the right way to do it. It's just very expensive. And the, uh, the, the big research observatories uh, consortiumize and uh, you know lay a whole bunch of cables at once and uh, split the cost. So we do it. Thank you. Michael Richmond asks, how might one apply for time on the Mies telescope? <laughs> you just did, <laughs> Michael. <laughs> <laughs> when do you want it? <laughs> Maybe there's a quid pro quo there. <laughs> no, my, Michael is already a friend of the observatory. He yes. can do things yes. whenever he wants. And we haven't decided yet how we're going to do uh, summer tours yet. I think it's still up in the air from what I saw from Carol earlier. Yeah, so, we, we, we haven't been told our rules, and I'm sure they will wait until the very last minute to do so. Uh, yeah, it's, but on but on the subject of tours, I do want to say, you, you know, it, the way that Dan has told this story, it took years to make all this happen. Dan had this vision years ago, yeah. um, and isn't it, it? It's just serendipity that the pandemic <laughs> came upon us um, in su in such timing that 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 this whole capability reached maturity at a, at a time when it was absolutely critical. You know, for for student use and professor use and and tours and everything and like, wow. Yeah, <laughs> that's that. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> if we if we had uh, if we had gotten the AT and T connection six months earlier, the pandemic would would have barely left a dent in uh, in our uh, classroom observing programs. You know, we still had to put up with the, the things that you guys had to endure uh, during uh, uh, Astronomy 244. But uh, uh, after that, everything was working fine. Last semester, I, I added, uh, uh, as I already listed, a, an observing project in Astronomy 106, which is a, 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 a class for non-science majors. And they were doing transits of exoplanets. Cool. That's great. <laughs> I mean, we're just dreaming of that stuff 10 years ago. It's kind of yeah, amazing. It's, it's, it, now it's easy. Yeah. <laughs> it's good. And I'll, and I'll bet we got some new astronomy majors out of that. <laughs> I, doubt, I doubt it. But uh, <laughs> one can always hope. <laughs> There's a lot of physics there. <laughs> Any other questions for Dan? Jeff Carr wanted to thank you for the update and the functionality. Saw that. But I hope to be able to demonstrate the uh, actual usage by doing a supernova observation. So I'll get together with Kelly and get another date. The last yeah, date. We, uh, yeah, we really got to get that done. Let, uh, uh, clear your calendar for for uh, uh, for spring break. Uh, oh, that's right. When is the when is spring break? Uh, it starts on Friday, the fourth of March, and uh, which is you know you're busy at the very beginning of that. And yeah, we'll but I, we could do it during the week. Sleep for a few days, but uh, 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 but the whole week after that is uh, okay. Is break. That's 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 a good idea. Cool. Yeah, everybody be gone. Yeah, we yeah that that needs to be done. It's too bad that uh, it's too bad uh, the uh, the first one was uh, uh, summarily clouded out because uh, that, yeah. uh, that was a lot brighter than the ones that uh, that Dave's got now. Yeah, yeah. All right, we'll figure it out. We'll we, do it. Yeah, we. Uh, by the way, Dave, we could we. Uh, I've done an exoplanet transit at uh, at seventeenth magnitude. We can do a supernova at 18th magnitude. <laughs> well, you're good on the 18. Great. 18, <laughs> you get a lot more targets. Well, uh, also some really cool ones too. Um, I know it's below your horizon, but are you aware of the famous Hubble scope telescope uh, image of the ring galaxy? 
I, I think I saw that. That's I pretty cool. That. <laughs> yes. Uh, the Ring Galaxy is a supernova in it right now. Yeah, that, uh, I think that's too low for us, but. Uh, yeah, that's way too low for you guys. Yeah, that's Southern Hemisphere stuff. <laughs> but it's just there, you know, every now and then you get a cool one. Um, we went two years with nothing brighter than the 14th magnitude. And all of a sudden we got three 11th magnitude ones. Wow. Yeah. Well, that, yeah, that's, everybody can do those. Those I can get with my eight inch scope. Yeah, we should. Wait, I started the page was so I could find these things. There was no the, listing out there of them. We should go for a record of how many telescopes pointed simultaneously at a, at a supernova. There you go. I bet, <laughs> I bet we could get nine or 10. <laughs> Any other questions, comments? Awesome. Well, thank you, Dan. Appreciate your, uh, your bringing this to us. It was a lot of fun. And uh, it's it's amazing what what we could do now, having having experienced about a lot of the people that were here tonight, ex have experienced it, and so it's, it's kind of interesting to see what went into making this whole thing happen. Well, uh, continue to enjoy it. The uh, uh, you know it's uh, we're going to keep it up. Awesome, awesome. All right. Well, if there's no other questions, I'll let everyone go. Thanks for coming, everybody. Glad to see you, Dan. Thank you. Glad Thank you. All, all smiling faces. Thank you. Take care, yeah, everybody. Thanks. thanks, Dan. Good to see you. <laughs> Have a good night. Yep.